you guys okay to start now? Okay. Um, this is going to be a tag team lecture. Brad is going to start, and then I'm going to finish. Um, I just want to say we're going to. There were some topics that came up during the lecture that we haven't gone over yet, like aberrations and such, and so you'll get that. Next. So we've uh, we've talked a lot so far about signal to noise ratio and what it is. And now Jennifer and I are going to talk a little bit about things that you can do in your uh, experimental planning to uh, to optimize your signal to noise ratio um, in your images. So if you want to increase your signal to noise ratio, you've got two options. You can decrease the noise or you can increase the signal. And how much signal you measure depends on two things. It depends on how bright is your sample, so how many photons is your, your sample actually emitting, and, uh, and how much light emitted by your sample actually makes it all the way through your microscope to the detector. And so how bright your sample is, how much, much light you get from, uh, from your, your specimen depends on, uh, on, in large part, on your fluorophore. So the photons that you're, you're detecting as your signal come from fluorophores um, as, as a result of the fluorescence reaction. So fluorophores are any chemical compound that can emit light when excited by light. So fluorophores can undergo this, uh, this special type of, of chemical reaction called fluorescence. So in the fluorescence reaction, a fluorophore absorbs a photon of light and enters uh, an excited state. And then it uh, it's emits another photon of light, which is of a longer wavelength, so lower energy. If you remember uh, Jennifer talking about uh, about the, the wavelength of light yesterday, and uh, and and so you got in this case we showed blue light, uh, and then is absorbed, and then green light is emitted. But um, but there are fluorophores that absorb all different wavelengths of light and emit all wavelengths, different wavelengths of light. Um, but what is consistent is that the, uh, the photon that's emitted is of a lower energy than the photon that's absorbed. And so the, um, the difference between the wavelength that's emitted and the wavelength that is absorbed is called the Stokes shift. And to understand why we have a Stokes shift, why we don't just emit a photon that's the same wavelength as what we absorb, we have to look at what actually happens to the molecule during the fluorescence reaction. So these are called Jablonski diagrams. They're kind of like, they, they look a little bit like musical clefts and what these, these lines indicate uh, are different um, energy states of our molecule. And so our molecule starts off in the ground state and, uh, and it's absorbed the photon and it moves into an, what's called an excited singlet state. So uh, an electron moves out into a higher uh, higher orbital, and it's now in this state that's, that's very high energy and it's characterized by a lot of tension and instability. So the molecule is not super happy to be in this tense excited state, and so it will very quickly undergo what's called vibrational relaxation and release some of that energy in the form of heat. So now it's still in an excited state, but it's uh, it's in a lower energy, more stable excited state, and it's going to sit here for some period of time, which we refer to as the lifetime of the fluorophore. It's usually on the order of nanoseconds. Eventually, the fluorophore is going to return to the ground state. And one of the ways that it can do that is to emit all its energy as a photon. And so you can see now that the reason why our emitted photon is lower energy than our absorbed photon is because we lost some of that energy while we were in the excited state. So we have less to put out than what we, we took in. Furthermore, um, it's when we often talk about fluorophores as say, you're talking about GFP, you say it, it absorbs blue light and emits green light. But in reality, fluorophores are capable of being excited by a range of wavelengths and they're capable of emitting a range of wavelengths. So in the case of GFP, um, GFP is most likely to emit a green fluorophore, but it also may emit a red fluorophore. And so these curves here that we're looking at, um, these are, we call these the excitation and emission spectra of our fluorophore. 
And you can think of them a little bit like probability curve. Um, where, so this, this molecule is most likely to be excited by, you know, 488 light, but it also has a chance of being excited by like ultraviolet light. Um, all fluorophores have their own excitation and emission spectra that can look vastly different from one another. So, um, so there's no really kind of typical one. Some of them have really, really broad uh, spectra. Some of them have multiple peaks. Some of them have larger, smaller stoke shifts. And understanding what the spectra of your, your fluorophore is can really help you uh, design your experiments um, optimally to, to suit that fluorophore. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, but uh, uh, it's important to, to consider kind of these aspects of how your fluorophore behaves when you are designing, going into choosing a fluorophore for your experiment. And, uh, and so the fluorophores that we use for fluorescence imaging typically fall under two major categories. There are organic dyes. These are things like, uh, like uh, alexafluor, geneliafluor, dyes like DAPI, FITSI, a lot of the things that you conjugate to a, a, a secondary, uh, secondary antibody, certain antihistochemistry, for example. Then there are fluorescent proteins like EGFP, M-cherry, M-neon green, these are um, are these uh, these proteins that you genetically encode uh, so that they are are uh, attached to your protein of interest. Um, there are pros and cons to both of these classes of uh, of fluorophores. Organic dyes are just generally brighter, um, so all other things considered, you're more likely to get more photons from an organic dye than a fluorescent protein. Um, however, fluorescent proteins have some special qualities that sometimes make them very preferable to organic dyes. Uh, so organic dyes usually require some type of labeling strategy. So you've got some fluorophore that's outside of your, uh, your, your specimen. You need to get it into your sample and target it towards whatever thing you want to label. And so that means you've got to consider some things. You need to consider how are you going to get that molecule into your, your sample. So a lot of times you need like permeabilization step. Um, you need fixation if you're going to do that. Um, you have to worry about non-specific binding, which could give you false positives. Whereas with fluorescent proteins, they're genetically encoded, so they're extremely specific. Um, your your protein is just gonna it's gonna be translated with whatever you're you're interested in and attached to it. Um, so you you worry a lot less about non-specific uh, non-specific signals. Um, because you don't need a labeling strategy, you don't need fixation and permeabilization, um, you can do fluorescent, uh, image fluorescent proteins in live samples, whereas that's really tricky in, in organic dyes because uh, a lot of that, that kind of labeling strategy is not super compatible with, with keeping your sample alive. Um, whereas fluorescent proteins, your sample is basically making your tag and doing the labeling for you. So you can just kind of watch them going about their business um, without having to worry about how you're going to get your label in there. Um, so you got to choose between these classes of fluorophores. But then even once you've done that, there are still lots and lots of fluorophores to choose from. Um, so to give you an example, this dot right here, this is the original GFP that was cloned from the jellyfish. Um, and all of these other dots are derivatives of it. So they're, they've been engineered in some way to be maybe brighter, more stable, uh, different uh, excitation and emission spectra suited for different applications. There are tons of them. And even this is just a small fraction of all of the fluorescent proteins that are available out there. Um, and so, uh, and more and more are being developed all the time. And, and with organic dyes too, there are a, a lot of options out there. So choosing the right fluorophore for your particular application is going to take a little bit of research on your part. And so uh, we have a tool that we recommend um, that you guys can use to do this, which is called fpbase.org. Um, and so fpbase.org is it's made by our own Tally Lambert. And, um, and the FP stands for fluorescent protein, but it's, it's actually a database of not just fluorescent proteins, but also uh, other types of fluorophore, like organic dyes. In the next uh, couple slides, I'm going to show you how to use it to compare um, the hardware on your microscope with the fluorophores you want to image. 
Um, but it's got a lot of really uh, useful tools. So this is uh, the, the, you can, can make your own little like virtual microscope. So you can take your microscope, put whatever hardware you've got on it, and then you can save it. And then you can compare that to different chlorophores you might want to use for your experiment. Um, but another thing that is, it's got that it's, is really useful is a, a database of information on all of these, uh, on thousands of fluorophores. So, um, so a lot of times when we ask people what fluorophore they're using in their image, they'll say something like GFP, but people are very rarely just using, you know, the GFP straight out of the jellyfish because it's not that great fluorophore. People have come up with better stuff since then. Um, these are all green fluorescent proteins, but as you can see from these numbers here, we have, we'll talk about in a minute what these numbers mean, but these are proteins that have vastly different behavior. So technically you could say all of these are GFP, but they would probably perform very differently in your experiment and have very different um, characteristics. So you wanna know specifically which one you're using. And, uh, and you can use these numbers when you're planning your experiment, to try to predict which ones will work well in your, in your purposes. So, if we just look at what these numbers indicate. So lambda X, lambda M, and Stokes describe the spectra of our molecule. So we're gonna uh, talk about how to use a spectra viewer um, to, uh, to kind of assess the excitation and emission spectra of fluorophores that we wanna use. Extinction coefficient and quantum yield play a major role in determining how bright that fluorescent protein or fluorophore might be. So extinction coefficients is the likelihood that an available photon will be absorbed by a fluorophore. So in a perfect world, every time a photon of the correct excitation wavelength came near your fluorophore, your fluorophore would absorb it and enter the excited state. But in reality, sometimes that just doesn't happen. And so a fluorophore with a high extinction coefficient really likes photons. It's, it's more likely to absorb a photon and enter the excited state than a fluorophore with a low extinction coefficient. Similarly, quantum yield is the ratio of photons emitted per photons absorbed. So in a perfect world, every time a fluorophore absorbs a photon and enters the excited state, then it would definitely emit a photon, be guaranteed. But in reality, Sometimes a fluorophore, it gets excited and just doesn't release a photon. It just returns to ground state uh, through, through another mechanism or does something else. So a fluorophore with a high quantum yield likes to go undergo the fluorescence reaction. It's more likely to emit a photon once it's been excited. Brightness is the product of these two. So it's taking into account how likely your fluorophore is to absorb a photon, be excited, and how likely it is to emit a photon. So taken together, this kind of gives you a, a, an idea of how much light you're going to get out of that fluorophore. And uh, but uh, which can be a, a nice thing to look at to start if you're you're, you're looking for a bright fluorophore. But uh, there are other things you have to take into consideration too, because the behavior of a fluorophore is very environment dependent. So um, so these numbers over here kind of indicate that a little bit. So pKa is the acid tolerance of your, your molecule. So, um, so a lot of fluorophores tend to get dimmer in more acidic environments. So uh, even if your fluorophore is super bright, you know, in, a, a, in, in, in vitro, if you're studying a, you know, compartment like a lysosome or something that's, that's really acidic, then your fluorophore might be really dim. Um, so you want to kind of understand what pH, how pH stable that fluorophore is. AG stands for oligomerization tendency, and uh, and so so fluorescent proteins um, naturally, like in the wild, they like to dimerize and form higher order assemblies. We don't want them to do that in our experiments because if they are binding together then they could be dragging your protein of interest into aggregates and disrupting its localization. So fluorescent proteins with this, this, uh, this indicator M here, uh, that means that it's a fluorescent protein that's been engineered so it doesn't, it doesn't like itself anymore. It won't, uh, it won't dimerize and form higher order assemblies. 
Mat is maturation time. So this means how long it takes once you've translated the protein for it to fold and fluoresce, because there is a certain time associated with getting it into the right conformation. And lifetime is how long your fluorophore remains in the excited state. Um, it has to do with like how fast you can get photons from that fluorophore. Uh, yeah? Um, I believe minutes. Just sit minutes, Sally. Probably the that it's not but even with the M it's not fully monomeric. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> One more question. Yeah. Uh, the brightness for all of these uh, excision coefficients are fine. That is at the peak excitation, right? But I believe so. It's like the best we can get from it. But that's a, that's a good point. I mean, extinction coefficient itself is a spectrum, right? But that number is the peak. Is the peak. Mm -hmm. so when you're using your laser, that's not exactly the peak excitation. You need to calibrate right. the actual Right. Yeah, right. It's like if you look at the quantum oh, efficiency, sorry. it's like, I can't stop talking. Okay. <laughs> no, you can go. No, good. I wasn't that time. Oh, yeah. I will say we've actually been using a two rate, and that's super cool because you can't play it on the stage. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, what what does that like four point seven mean that that measurement it can have pH of four point seven or like how does it dye into the, the brightness of the four point? I forget exactly what the four point what happens at that pH, but it's something like higher uh higher pH at like Sally help that is the pH at which you will reach half maximal. And as you start like dropping the pH, you're going to lose intensity and eventually get zero, and that's the pH that we get to have. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So, uh, another property that varies between fluorophores is the rate at which it photobleaches. So photo bleaching is uh, is the irreversible destruction of fluorophore molecules in the excited state. So it's basically the bane of every fluorescence microscopy system because it's a fact of light that as you image your sample, as you expose it to light, it's going to be getting dimmer. So here we have a graph of a bunch of different fluorescent proteins, and we've got their it's their their how much many photons we're getting from them, their brightness on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, and so. As you can see, each of these fluorescent proteins is getting much dimmer over time. It's undergoing photo bleaching. What I want you to take away from this graph is not that M citrine sucks and MEGFC is always great, because uh, that's actually extremely experimentally and situationally dependent. So if you were to repeat this experiment, it might look completely different. What I do want you to take away from this is that fluorophores bleach at vastly different rates. So just because you're using one green fluorophore and it's bleaching too fast to make your measurement doesn't mean necessarily that no other fluorophore will perform better. It's also really, really hard to predict based on looking at like other photo bleaching curves that aren't in your particular sample under your particular conditions, how your fluorophore is gonna behave. So it can be a good idea if you've got kind of the time and the resources to use FP-Base to try to find, you know, like a few candidates fluorophores and test them out in your sample and see how they actually behave um, for your under your conditions. Because you when your your fluorescent protein is kind of being expressed throughout the life of your organism, um, there are some things that you need to consider when you're choosing a fluorescent protein. Um, you you want to make sure that your fluorescent protein still localizes and functions normally. So what you're basically doing is like you're taking your protein and you're just sticking a whole other protein onto it. 
So it's like it's very conceivable that doing that could screw up some aspect of your fluorescent protein's function. So you need to come up with some controls to make sure it's still localizing properly and make sure it's still doing whatever biological biological function it's supposed to do. One thing that can be helpful for determining this is if you just try expressing that fluorescent protein on its own without any um, any with, without your protein of interest, you should see it, it expressed diffusely throughout the cytoplasm. If it localizes anywhere in particular, then you need to worry that, well, maybe it's bringing my protein there and, and, and it's not supposed to be there. So you want to see it not really have any strong opinions about where it localizes. Your pretty does that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. One more example of things you don't do that should be done. And by the way, you should probably do it for every cell type. Right. Oh, yeah. Is the fluorescent protein spectra compatible with my setup? Hold that thought. That's what I'm going to talk about in a few slides, how to assess that with the hardware. Um, and is there a new version of my fluorescent protein or a version more suited to my experiment? So new fluorescent protein fluorophores are being designed all the time. And frequently, we wind up using a certain fluorophore because we inherited a project from a postdoc. And when they designed it five years ago, that was the fluorophore they chose. And sometimes, I mean, that can be fine a lot of the time, but you just want to make sure that you convince yourself that it's the right floor for to use. And even if it was the right floor for to use five years ago, it might not still be the right floor for to use. Um, so it's worth just kind of looking into it and, and making sure you are, are comfortable that it is, is the right one for the job. So that's kind of like we can we can pick a floor for that is as bright as we want that's making as many photons as we want but if we're not doing a great job of getting those photons through our microscope to our detector then our signal to noise ratio is still going to be bad so in addition to thinking about how much how bright your sample actually is we want to think about our hardware and we want to think about how to make it as light efficient as possible and as we've already talked about when, uh, in the, the, when we were talking about confocal and, uh, and, and, uh, and Tally's lecture on PMTs this morning, confocals are not very light efficient. We necessarily have to lose a ton of the photons that our, our specimen makes if we're doing confocal microns. So our job is to try to optimize where we can in the hardware so we don't throw away photons we don't have to. And uh, and so what we need to do, we need to make sure we're using filter sets that are well matched to whatever fluorophore we're trying to image. So uh, so filters uh, block some wavelengths and transmit others, as I'm sure you guys already know. And uh, and there are a couple different types of filters that are out there. So long pass filters block all wavelengths that are shorter than a certain cutoff and transmit everything above it. Short pass filters do the opposite. Much more common to use in, uh, in fluorescence microscopy, particularly multicolor imaging, are band pass filters. These are filters that pass a band of wavelengths and block everything above or below that. And they are, they're, they're described by their center wavelength. So that's the, the middle wavelength that the, uh, the fluorophore can, uh, that the, the filter transmits. And the full width half max, which is how thick that, that pass band is. Um, so if you go to a website like Chroma or Semrock, you're looking for a filter, and you find one that's called 525 over 50, that means it's a band pass filter, it's got its center wavelength at 525, and it's got a full width half max of 50. So it's, it's got a range of 50 nanometers that it'll pass. So you could think of it as like 525 plus or minus 25. So how do you make sure that you're using a well matched floor for a filter set combination? Well, this is another place where a spectra viewer like FC base really shines. Um, because what it does is it allows you to visually compare the excitation and emission spectra for a fluorophore you're interested in with a filter set that you're thinking of using for that fluorophore. And so when you if you go to FC base and you select a fluorophore and a, a filter set, um, what you'll see is you'll see uh, you'll see the the excitation spectrum for your fluorophore on the left here. So in this case, this is EGFP, um, but it could be any fluorophore. Um, the emission spectrum for that fluorophore, the dichroic mirror, the path band for the excitation filter, and the path band for the emission filter. So if the filter set is going to be well matched to a fluorophore we want to image with it. 
it's got to meet a few criteria. It needs to pass excitation light at the correct wavelength. We need photons to excite our, uh, our uh, fluorophores with. It needs to exclude excitation light from detection. And we need to collect as much emission light as we possibly can. Um, and, and so to assess that, we, uh, we first start by, by looking at the excitation filter. And so uh, we look at what we're particularly interested in is, uh, is the area under the curve between the excitation filter and the excitation spectrum for the fluorophore. That means how much light is actually going to excite the fluorophore is going to make it through this filter. And we call that our excitation efficiency. Excluding excitation light from detection means that the excitation and emission filter can't overlap. If you buy a preset, pre-made filter set like a filter tube, um, usually you know they they shouldn't, but you should check. And if you're mixing and matching, then then for sure you should you should pay attention to that. And then for emission uh, collecting emission light, it's the same deal with the the emission filter. So we want to look at the area under the curve for the uh, the emission spectrum in the emission filter pass band. And, uh, and that is the emission efficiency. And so that's saying, all right, how much of the light that this fluorophore emits are we going to be able to collect through this filter? And so this is a pretty well-matched filter set. Um, this is actually a, uh, a filter set that I, I took from one of our microscopes and we use the filter set to image GFT. So um, this would be something that would, would look pretty good. But if we compare that to another filter set on the same microscope, um, we can see that we're still passing a decent amount of the excitation light, um, but we're only collecting the, a tail of this emission spectrum for this fluorophore. So that means that most of the light that GFT make, EGFT makes in this case is not going to be collected. Um, so we would be throwing away a ton of photons. So because this is a confocal workshop, I also want to mention what happens when you're using a laser. So a laser is, uh, it, it emits pretty much monochromatic light. So if you're using a, a, a 488 laser, you're basically getting 488 nanometer light, maybe with a little plus or minus amount. But what you wanna do in this case is you wanna make sure that your, uh, your excitation wavelength that you're using comes as close to that peak uh, in, your, uh, in your excitation spectrum as possible um, to make sure you're, you're exciting as much of the floor for as you can. So filters are critical to our ability to image more than one fluorophore in the same sample. So that's something that we like to do a lot of. We like to look at the, the spatial relationships between objects that we care about. But if we remember from, uh, from Pally's lectures this morning, the detectors we're using are monochromatic detectors. So if we've got a green and red fluorophore in our sample, our detector is not capable of telling if a photon that it sees came from the green floor or the red floor. So we can't spatially separate our, uh, our floor force by wavelength using our detector. So instead, what we do is we separate them temporally using filters. So we will, for example, in this case, put our green filter set in place and capture an image. And we will make the assumption that all the photons the detector sees during that exposure uh, or during that, that scan in a, in, in a point scanner come from our green floor floor. Then we will switch and put the red filter set in place and, uh, and do the same thing and assume that all of the photons seen during that track or that exposure came from that floor floor. And then when we tell our software to give us a multicolor image, it will pseudo color the, uh, the images in according to, to which channel it came from. So it's not able to actually say, this is a green photon. It's able to say, this is when I captured this photon, so we're assuming it's green, so I'm gonna display it as green. Um, separating our channels with like this requires making two significant assumptions. We're assuming that all the light that we detect is from fluorophore that we have added to our specimen. And we're assuming that the filter sets completely separate the fluorophores added to the sample. So, um, so let's go through these assumptions and talk about where they sometimes fall apart and, and how you need to address them. So the first assumption is that all the light you detect is from fluorophore that you've added, but in reality, many biomolecules are fluorescent. 
So this is a list of biological molecules, and the biologists in the room could probably tell me a lot more about what these actually do than, than I currently understand. But what I, I can tell you about them is that all of these are fluorophores, meaning under certain conditions, all of these molecules can, uh, can absorb light and, and emit light. And you'd be hard pressed to find a biological system that contains like none of these. So what winds up happening is that, uh, is that very often when you shine excitation light on a, on a, on a, a sample, it's fluorescent even though you haven't added anything to it. And this endogenous fluorescence is called autofluorescence. And if you're not aware of it, it can kind of confound your results a lot. Um, so this is an example from the literature from 2015. Um, there was a lot wrong with this study, but one of the, the things that was wrong with it was that they didn't include an unlabeled control for autofluorescence. So what these authors claimed is they claimed that they found a way, and it's probably going to be easier to see on that screen, but it might work on both. Uh, they claimed that they found a way to convert um, ordinary cells into pluripotent stem cells. Um, using uh, they, they had a treatment that involved treating the cells with acid and squeezing them through tiny little syringes. And their, their indicator of pluripotency was a reporter that was supposed to fluoresce green to indicate that the cells were pluripotent. And what they found is that after they treated their cells, they saw an increase in green fluorescence. So they thought, well, great, they're pluripotent, now it works. But when someone else tried to repeat this, they included a control where they treated the cells in the exact same way, but they didn't have the reporter. So what they found when they did that is that they saw the exact same increase in green fluorescence when the reporter gene wasn't even present as when the reporter gene was present but wasn't on. And they compared that to an instance where the reporter gene definitely was on. And it turns out what they were measuring after their treatment was an increase in autofluorescence because autofluorescence in your cells can change and it tends to change when your cells get more stressed. And, uh, and, and treating cells with acid and squeezing them through syringes stress the cells out. So increase in autofluorescence, and it led them to draw the wrong conclusion because they didn't include that control. Autofluorescence, uh, it can, can be in any channel. It can vary by, uh, by cell health, cell type, and the environment, and it can exhibit a wide variety of distributions. So neither of these images from the literature has any fluorophore in it, but it looks like pretty specific distribution of signal because it is specific. It's just not it's a specific subset of organelles that are more autofluorescent than others, and it's probably not the subset of organelles that you really care about studying. But you can imagine that if you were testing out a new probe or something and you saw some distribution like this, you might conclude, hey, it looks specific, it probably works. So because autofluorescence can be so uh, so varied, the only way to tell what's autofluorescence and what's not is to do an unlabeled control. So uh, control that you treat exactly the same as your experiment, but you don't add any fluorophores to it. The second assumption is that we make when we, we separate our multicolored channels using filters is that these filters that we're relying on are able to completely separate the fluorophores that we've added. And, uh, and so what we've got here in these images uh, that Tally made are, uh, are two populations of cells. Um, one population has only CFC, one population has only YFC, and we're imaging these two populations of cells with filters designed for, like for intended to image CFC. And if this assumption held true all the time, then this is what we would always see when we did this type of experiment. We see the CFC cells, but we don't see the YFC cells. But unfortunately, uh, we often see something like this instead where now we're doing the opposite. We're imaging these two populations of cells with the YFC filter. If we look in the top right panel there, we can see the cells, but these cells don't have any YFC in them. They just have CFC. And that's because sometimes bleed through happens. And so bleed through is what happens when, uh, when, uh, when we excite and collect signal from a fluorophore while using a filter set designed to image, uh, intended to image a different fluorophore. And again, one of the reasons why it's bad is because our detectors are monochromatic. So this bleed through signal is just gonna be added on top of whatever your actual signal from that channel was. There are some ways that you can design your experiments to minimize the chance that you'll see bleed through. And one way to do that is to choose fluorophores with well-separated spectra. So go to your spectra viewer and look at, compare the spectra of all of the, the, uh, the fluorophores that you wanna to image together. 
and um, and you ideally want to choose fluorophores that are as far away from one another on the spectrum as possible. That becomes increasingly difficult as you add fluorophores to your, your experiment, but you just want to do the best you can. You also want to compare each filter set you're going to use with all of your fluorophore spectra, not just the matched fluorophore. So we just talked about how to look at and compare your, your filter set you want to use with the fluorophore you want to use it with. But also compare it that uh, those filters to all the other fluorophores you don't want to use it with that you want to include in your experiment. And in order to see bleed through, you need to, to do two things. You need to excite the off-target fluorophore and you need to collect its emission from the off-target fluorophore. So if we look at this situation here where we're comparing our CFP filter set to the YFP spectra, we are exciting a little bit of YFP, but we're not collecting any of its emissions. So under these circumstances, we'd be unlikely to see bleed through. It's not perfectly ideal because the fact that we're exciting YFP means we might be bleaching it, but from a bleed through perspective, this is probably okay. But then if we look at the other situation where we have the YFP filter set and the CFP spectra, we are exciting a little bit of the tail of the, the CFP excitation spectrum. And we are collecting a pretty big wedge of the, the emission spectrum. And, uh, and so you might say, well, we're exciting CFP, but only a little bit of it. So if we're gonna excite a ton of YFP, then why does it matter? And that is the, the third point here, which is you want to label such that different fluorophores are similar intensity. Um, and that's because it's true that a tiny amount of bleed through might not make much of a difference if the fluorophores are equally bright. But if one is way brighter than the other, then 1% bleed through of that channel into another could be very significant. And that's what we're seeing here, basically. The CFP is much brighter than the YFP. So even though only a tiny amount of the CFP is getting excited, that's enough to contaminate the YFP signal. And, uh, and so uh, these ways that you can kind of preemptively deal with bleed through when you're doing your designing your experiment, they're, they're great, but the, spe the Spectre Viewer is a predictive tool. It's not an oracle. It doesn't guarantee or promise that you won't see bleed through. The only way to be sure there's no bleed through in your multi-channel experiment is to include single label control. So, um, so like that, that those so that panel of images that I showed you a couple slides ago that have CFP and what only or YFP only. For every color, every fluorophore you want to image, you need to include a control that only has that fluorophore if you want to be positive that there's no bleed through. Finally, bleed through can sometimes be corrected computationally after the fact, but the best strategy is to minimize it before you acquire because. You can subtract the uh, the background signal from the extra fluorophores, but you cannot subtract that additional Poisson noise. So um, your signal to noise ratio will be better if you just don't collect the photons in the first place. So uh, finally, in addition to providing false positives about where your fluorophores localization and intensity, bleed through and autofluorescence contribute background to your image and uh, and so decrease uh, signal to noise ratio. So it's important to, uh, to, to minimize those uh, kind of off-target photons to, to get the best signal-to-noise ratio possible. Hand it over to Joe. Okay, so I'm going to continue um, with tips and tricks to optimize signal-to-noise ratio. Um, in this case, I'm going to talk about objective lenses and specimen problems. So I'll remind you quickly what refraction is. Um, refraction, what we're looking at here is a laser that is passing through air and then it hits the interface between the air and the piece of glass. And so what you see is some of that light reflects off the glass, but some of it enters the glass. And you can see that the, the light path now changes. Um, and what's happening here, actually the light is slowing down as it enters the second material and that results in this you know, change in trajectory that we refer to as refraction. And I'm bringing this up because refraction um, is occurring through your, your microscope. Um, and sometimes that's a good thing because it's focusing light with your lenses. And sometimes it's not so great. Um, and a, a, a measure of um, refraction is the refractive index. So materials with different refractive index if you pass from one material of one refractive index to a material with a different refractive index, you will see refraction at that digit. And so as you see here, the materials that we are using that are in the optical path have different refractive indices. 
the air, the glass, the, the immersion oil, um, and your cells. Uh, and so, for example, as I as I said, uh, lenses focus light based on refraction. So we have light traveling through air, hits the glass, it refracts, hits the um, next surface of the, the, the glass, enters the air, refracts again to focus into a point in this case. Your specimen, we generally are placing that on glass, which has a different refractive index than the air. And your sample has some refractive index, and you know you can maybe estimate that based on what like a solution of protein has or whatever. We don't really know what the refractive index is in most cases, but we know it's different if it's a if it's a biological sample, live biological sample in particular. So I'm going to point out. Um, I would love to have time to tell you what all these markings on the objective lens mean, but I think in the interest of time, I'll just point to the um, perhaps the most critical one for this workshop. Um, but all these things do have meaning. Um, important meaning. Uh, so, so the right of the manufacturer's name, and I should show you, I'm, I'm showing a Nikon lens here, but the general layout is the same for the different manufacturers. Um, and so we have the manufacturer's name at the top, and right under that, there's a phrase, at, um, your plan apo. That phrase will vary, um, and I'll, I'll tell you the different ones so you're most likely to see. And that refers to the extent to which that objective lens has been corrected for aberration when we get back to aberrations and what that means. You all know how to find the magnification. After the magnification is the numerical aperture. So slash and then numerical aperture. And that number is super important. You remember that it's part of the resolution equation. And I'm gonna talk about that in the numerical aperture in, in more detail in a moment. Not every lens, but many lens, if they're meant to be used with a particular immersion media, um, that will be marked on the objective here. It's marked with immersion oil. So that means that the lens was designed such that you will put immersion oil between your cover slip and the lens. I'll explain why that's good later. Um, intended cover slip thickness. You'll, you'll see there's an affinity symbol on almost every objective lens you'll use. You'll see an affinity symbol. And after that affinity symbol, after what these other things mean, if you want to know later, um, there's a slash and then a number. And that number refers to the thickness of cover slip glass that the optical engineer who designed that lens assumed that you were going to use, okay? And that number is in millimeters. The working distance of the lens, actually I think I put the slide out, but the working distance of the lens also in millimeters is, is marked there. That's nice to glance at when you're focusing, right? Because if your working distance is tiny and you're, and you're this far away from the, the sample, you're going to be all day with your focus on. So, um, okay, so this is the same equation, the very late uh, criteria equation that, that I showed yesterday. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and the, the numerical aperture is part of this equation. So, what is numerical aperture? Numerical aperture is equal to the sign of the angle of acceptance of that lens. And I'll explain what that means in more detail in a moment. Actually, I'll explain that right now. Um, <laughs> so your sample is emitting light, right? The lens cannot collect all the light. It can only collect a portion of the light. And uh, certainly that light has to hit the lens. And the, the maximum angle of light, the maximum acceptance angle of light here uh, is, is called theta, is this. So we've got the, the maximum angle of light coming from your sample that that lens can collect. Um, the end here is the refractive index of the media between the lens and the specimen. So most commonly, if we're putting a media there, um, an immersion media, immersion oil, it can be other things. A dry lens is an air lens. We don't put anything. Um, Olympus mentioned uh, silicon immersion objectives. That's another option. For immersion media. So what these immersion medias do, um, in this case, we'll, I'll show uh, air and oil, is here we have a piece of glass and air between the glass and the lens. And light is going to travel through, is, is traveling through and hits that interface between the glass and the air. So we're going to get refraction, right? And so what that means is the maximum angle of light that is going towards your objective lens Right? If it weren't for refraction, it would make it into the lens. 
but because of the refraction, we're not able to collect them. If we place immersion oil here, the immersion oil that, uh, that we use has a, the same refractive index as the glass. And so it minimizes refraction. So you're now able to collect that same angle of light that refracted earlier in the last slide. Okay, yay. Now, that kind of looks like I'm gonna merge, put immersion oil on all the lenses. Why would I want that refraction to occur? Well, again, the optical engineer who designed the lens is making assumptions about or telling you what um, assumptions they have made about the refractive index of the material between the cover slip and the lens. So use what they want you to use or you're gonna wind up work off. So we know that numerical aperture is important for resolution. There's another bonus to numerical aperture, an important one, which is the greater the angle of acceptance, the more light the lens can collect. So even if you're not super worried about resolution for your uh, experiment, numerical aperture is going to allow you to collect more signal, increase the signal to noise ratio. Here's an example of that. Um, these are images that were collected with two different lenses, which are otherwise similar. So they're 40X plan four lenses. I'll get to the plan four part. Um, but the numerical aperture is different. The one on the left is a dry lens. The one on the right is an oil lens. And you can see that, so, so I took these in, with exactly the same detector settings and illumination settings and filters and all that stuff. So the only difference here that is being reflected is the um, numerical aperture. So the one on the right looks pretty decent. The one on the left, you're not seeing much at all. So you're not publishing the image on the left, right? So what are you going to do? to compensate for that numerical aperture. You're gonna to have to do something like crank up the illumination light or take a longer exposure time, right? And so you're gonna get more photo bleaching, more phototoxicity in a live cell experiment. And so this is a really important choice, right? As far as um, collecting signal and how much light you're gonna to have to put on your sample as well. Um, <clears throat> magnification, very, I threw this in for free. Um, <laughs> magnification is also going to affect your brightness um, with nothing else changing, right? So here we have a lens that has the same numeric or lenses that have the same numerical aperture, the same correction for aberration, but different magnification, right? And you can see that the lower magnification is much brighter. So the way that you can think about this is we're projecting this optical image onto the digital detector that Tally told us about. And if the lenses have the same numerical aperture, you're collecting the same amount of light. If you magnify the image, you're spreading that light over a larger area, you can think of it that way. And so you're getting less light per pixel. Right? So only use the amount of magnification that you actually need in order to get good sampling. Correction for aberration. Uh, I'm going to tell you about two aberrations, chromatic aberration and spherical aberration. Chromatic aberration, um, I'll describe by starting off with what we'd like to be the world, the world to be like. Um, so a perfect lens would focus here in this example, your green light onto the focal plane, and then you would switch to your other four four and you would focus your um, uh, purple light in this example, magenta light in this example, and it would focus to exactly the same focal plane, right? Same spot, same focal plane. And so when you do the overlay, you'd have perfect co-localization for this example where there actually is co-localization, okay? But um, yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> What actually happens here is the angle of refraction is dependent on wavelength. So you're going to get a different angle of refraction with your different wavelengths of light, such that the different wavelengths of light will actually appear to be in different focal planes in the image, even if they came from the same exact object. Okay, that's chromatic aberration. Um, so you get this axial shift. 
And these are examples of real lenses, uh, of, of images taken from real lenses. Now, this is going to vary a lot. Don't look at this and think this is exactly what's going on with your lenses. Um, but just as an example, so these are these tetraspectives that you've been working at with that fluoresce in different wavelengths. So it's one object. We're collecting red, green, blue images of it. And you can see that these different phrases at the top, which indicate correction for aberration, manufacturers know that we would prefer this is not going on <laughs> in our, our lenses. So they do the, they, you know, try to correct for it as, as much as is possible. And these phrases indicate the extent to which the lens has been corrected. And so on the right, you can see that the plan apple lens is doing a much better job here. It has been um, designed to bring the red, green, and blue into the same focal plane. You can see it's not perfect, right? There's a, a green, green at the top and blue at the bottom. And that's very typical to see a slight shift between those even after the correction has been done in one. On the left, the plan floor lens is not as highly corrected for chromatic aberration. It's corrected for green and red. It's not corrected to bring blue into the focal plane in this example. Oh, spherical aberration. Yes. Yeah. So we've been talking about the trade off with that correction. Yeah. What kind of trade offs you have to consider? Yeah, I'll get to that. Yep. Yep. Um, spherical aberration. I would argue that this is the bane of everybody across the um, You didn't even know that, I bet, but it is. It's, it's affecting you right now. Um, so spherical aberration. Spherical aberration, the phenotype of spherical aberration is, is this. So ideally, when you send collimated light into one of these lenses, it would reflect, reflect, reflect that light and focus it all into exactly the same point. But that's actually not, not what happens in these spherically shaped lenses. Uh, yay, happy kitty. You um, instead, the light that travels through the center of the lens focuses at a different point, plane, than light that hits the periphery of the lens. And so, if not corrected for, a lens um, uh, in its natural state will have spherical aberration. And what it looks like is here shown on the right, which is the, the maxima of the point spread function, and this is axial. That's not good. Um, is more elongated. So this aberration reduces your resolution, right, in Z. And um, you can also see that it's asymmetrical. It's like brighter on one side than on the other. So we now have an asymmetrical elongated point spread function. Um, as I said, you now have a larger maxima in the axial direction. So your objects are going to be, have to be separated by an even greater distance before you're able to resolve them if you have sphere collaboration. You, so you, your maxima is spread out over more focal planes. So if you collect any uh, a single focal plane within that maxima, you are going to find if you have sphere collaboration, what we have here is the insects are the XY image of that point spread function, heat map pseudo colors. And you can see that the spherical aberration doesn't just increase your resolution, it decreases your signal, or sorry, decreases your resolution and decreases your signal as well. Okay. Uh, here's an image just to you know, show you that it's how detrimental it can be. Um, on the right, we have a, a setup where spherical aberration is minimized. And on the left, um, I can ask if I did this later. Um, there's some sphere collaboration introduced into that image. And you can see that, like, if you would know that this is sphere collaboration, right? You would just think that um, you had some more background fluorescence in there. I think that's just what's happened with your staining. Um, so it can be really tricky. It's, it's not um, easy to identify it in a, in a specimen where you have a lot of fluorophore. You can identify it with your fluorescent beads. You can also identify it if you have a spec in the background of your of your um, uh, slide on your slide, you can use that as well. So the objective lenses that we use are generally corrected for these two aberrations. They're corrected to some extent for these two aberrations, and another aberration as well, which I won't get into in detail, um, but it's called field curvature. And so field curvature is just the fact that these um, spherical lenses don't create a flat image, they create a slightly uh, uh, curved image. And so 
this is also something we don't like. What that looks like is you focus on the center and the periphery is out of focus. You focus on the periphery and the center is out of focus. And so most of the lenses that we use are corrected for that aberration. And that's what the word, let me get all these up here. Well, actually, let me go back. Okay, that's what the word plan means. So if the lens is a, has plan at the beginning of that phrase, it's been corrected for field curvature. Um, after that lenses, so there's there's three phrases that you might see most commonly, there are others, but most commonly that you'll see after that plan, which is achromat. These are on your tissue culture microscope. Hopefully you're not trying to do any quantitative microscopy with these. Um, they are not terribly corrected for um, these aberrations. The fluorite lenses, which are generally marked plan or just floor or plan floor, are corrected. And let me say these are not accurate for every you know, manufacturer and every lens. It's just to give you an idea of what's going on here. The fluorite lenses are going to be corrected for more colors of spherical aberration and chromatic aberration. Appreciate here that the manufacturers have to correct at the various wavelengths. Right, because different wavelengths refract, refract at different angles. It's not an easy job um, to, to do these corrections. Plan APO lenses are the most highly corrected. And so those are corrected um, for more colors of chromatic aberration. In many cases, they're corrected for the plan four and plan APO lenses are corrected for spherical aberration to the same extent. We'll get back to that. So um, how uh, downside, right? Why would you, so I can tell you one downside is the more correction, the more expensive the lens is. <laughs> and why is it more expensive? Because it's hard work to, um, to make these corrections. And um, so this is a story, uh, a quick story I'll tell you. Um, a user in my core set up a microperfusion device with, a, with this lens. Um, and uh, was having some problems with the software and we were busy, so they just went back to their lab and stayed there with their microfusion device for fusing. And for some reason, even though it's like microns per minute, they had 500 mil of solution attached to this device, so it was leaking, drip, 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 all over this lens for hours and hours. Um, and so I was like, great, this lens is trash. I can now go to my machine shop and have them cut it in half. So this is half an objective lens. You can see what's going on inside here. All of these various elements, they have different purposes, and I can't tell you exactly what they are. Um, but part of how they correct for aberrations is to add additional elements to the lens. And when you add more elements to the lens, less light is going to be able to get through that lens. Anytime light interacts some you know, matter, it's going to have an effect, and you're going to get less light through in those cases. And so one of the downsides of having a more highly corrected lens is that you're going to get like less light, oh, uh, less light through. Um, and so the plan apple lenses are the most highly corrected for chromatic aberration. So if you're working with multiple wavelengths, certainly if you're doing polarization experiments, that's a good choice. If you're struggling for photons and you're only imaging one color, the plan floor lenses are going to have less elements, and they may, all other things being equal, you may get more signal. So it's worse if you have plan floor and plan, you know, uh, plan apple lenses with similar uh, numerical aperture. It's worth comparing those to see if you're doing a one color experiment to see if you can get more signal out of that lens, the plan floor lens. Now, I told you your specimens mess up my microscope. Um, and one of the reasons why is because they, uh, your sample, introduces spherical aberration. And this comes primarily from mismatch in the refractive index of your specimen and the immersion media. Okay, so when are you doing that kind of thing? Every time you image live cells with an oil immersion lens. The oil immersion is going to have a higher refractive index than your live sample. Um, so something we need to think about here. And a little bit of a, another reminder about refraction here. So we have the light traveling through the cover slip in this example, and then refracting as it enters your specimen. Refraction does not occur if the light is traveling straight through. It only occurs when the light is coming at an angle. And the greater the angle, the greater the angle of re refraction. Okay, so the angle of refraction varies 
depending on the angle of light as it hits that interface between the media of two refractive indices. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to you know explain to you why you get more spherical aberration when you have a um, mismatch in refractive index. And in fact, as you saw yesterday, I hope, um, with the agro beads and agro sample, you get more spherical aberration as you get farther and farther away from the cover slip when you have that mismatch in refractive index. So I'm going to explain to you why that's the case. And I'm going to use a diagram. Let me first explain to you the diagram that I'm going to use, and then I'll explain the phenomenon. So what we have here is a simple diagram of an object that is emitting photons, we're collecting it with this lens, and we're refocusing it into an image. For the purpose of explaining this to you, I'm going to color the light that is being refocused into an image in this magenta. The light coming from the specimen will remain yellow. So they're not really different colors, right? They're the same color, but in, in reality, but we're just gonna pseudo color them here, different colors, just so that you can differentiate between them. Also to understand this, it is useful to flip this around and simply overlay it, okay? Because what we're gonna do is compare the behavior of the light coming from the specimen to the behavior of the light collected by the ejected lens and refocus. It's a little bit easier to do that if we overlay them, okay? Is that clear? All right, so we've got a, we'll call it a fluorescent bead on um, the cover slip, sitting on top of the cover slip. And we've got uh, uh, some sort of solution around it that has a different refractive index in this example. So when the bead is sitting right on the cover clip, there's not much um, of the solution of different refractive index surrounding it. And so mostly the light just goes right into the cover clip and there's minimal refraction. And so now if we think, if we go to, um, so here we have the light that is being collected by the objective. If we now go to the light being refocused into an image, again, superimposed, we're not going to get any spherical aberration here. So at the cover slip, we do okay if that sample is right up against the cover slip. If we move that object farther away from the cover slip, now what well, we will get refraction, right? But only of those light rays that are hitting that interface at an angle. Right, so the light ray in the center is not going to undergo refraction. As you move away, you get more and more refraction. So now this is the way the light is behaving when it's being collected. It's going to be refocused into an image, right? In later in the microscope, and this is not what's going to happen. The light is not going to refract back, right? There's nothing there. It's in there. It's not going to refract back. Instead, it's just going to travel straight through. And so what you're going to, so what's going to happen, the light's going to travel straight back through. And so the, the um, position of those light waves is going to be shifted up when they're refocused. Does that make sense? Now, these are the light waves at the periphery that have undergone the most refraction due to the angle at which they hit that interface. Sorry, that's overly animated here. Um, if we look at all the light waves now, I, I just had those few on the periphery just to get us oriented. Now I put them all back in. And what you can see is if you follow each one of the light waves, uh, the one in the center, again, doesn't undergo refraction, make more and more refraction as you go towards the periphery. And so that is what, if you follow those right waves, like uh, like rays up, you'll see that that results in this elongation and asymmetry of the image. And um, I'll, I'll just go quickly. If you go farther from the cover slip and you map this out in exactly the same way, you will see that there's even more spherical aberration. So this is what's happening to you. Uh, when you are imaging deeper and deeper into a sample. You start at the cover slip with minimal spherical aberration, and as you move deeper into your sample, you get more and more spherical aberration, assuming you haven't done something to, to um, or assuming that your sample is a different refractive index than the glass, which it is going to be in most cases. Um, and so this is really important 
to keep in mind when you are preparing your sample, right? You guys got to deal with it. We can't we can't fix it for you in the microscope necessarily. And so this is something that you should be thinking about when you prepare your sample. Um, how do you do that? Well, if you're fixing your samples, if you're using fixed samples, you're going to use some sort of mounting media, right? Um, that you put on the sample after you've done your labeling before you put it on the microscope. So the refractive index of that mounting media is super important. How many people know the refractive index of the mounting media they use for fluorescence microscopy? Yeah, well, it's about, uh, <laughs> hurry up. That's about the number I generally get of people who know. So, um, uh, you know, there's different commercially available mounting mediums, we can, medias, we can chat about the one you happen to be using, um, but some of them are really crap. Um, some of them, you know, not only have the wrong refractive index, but they scatter light. Some of them are quite good, but if you don't actually read the instructions on how to use them, right? So the, the prolonged theory from, from a vitrogen, if you look at the instructions, yes, you have to read the instructions on your mounting media, because if you read them, there'll be a little graph in there telling you that if you just plop it on the on the slide, put your cover still in and go right to the microscope, it's going to have the wrong refractive index. Where if you let it cure for 24 hours before you put on the microscope, over time the refractive index changes and increases, and at, you know will eventually reach the refractive index of the glass. Okay? So not only do you need to be using a good fluorescence mounting media, but you have to be using it correctly as well. Some of them take seven days to reach maximum. Read your instructions. <laughs> the instructions are more than just high tech. Intended cover slip thickness. This is also something that matters and that you have to um, consider when you're setting up your sample. So you will find in the vast majority of cases, you will find that this number is 0 0.17. You might see a dash. That means that lens is not supposed to, or sorry. You might see a dash. That means that lens is pretty crappy and it doesn't matter what it means. Um, <laughs> if you see a zero, that means the lens was meant to be used without a cover slip. You might also see a range of numbers, and generally that lens is going to have what's called a correction collar, which is a collar that you can rotate that moves elements within the lens that will correct for spherical aberration. It's generally marked for other things, like it might be the correction collar helps you correct for temperature or, I don't know, any number of other things. It's always correcting for spherical aberration. Okay? Um, and that is how I made that image with the yeah, I did the correction column. Um, that number, as I said, is in millimeters. And so uh, you are going to get off the best performance, again, if you operate your, uh, set up your sample and operate your microscope according to the assumptions that the optical engineer um, made in, in, in designing that lens. And if, so if it's marked with 170 micron thick piece of glass, that's going to get you the best results. In addition, so you need to be thinking about both of these things. You want the right thickness of the cover slip and your sample as close as possible to the cover slip and the refractive index of what you put your sample in. Now, obviously, if it's, I didn't say this, but if it's live, live samples, you cannot cure them into a hard mounting medium. You're going to have to, you know, this is just something you have to deal with, right? Or live with, I should say. Um, but as you saw, distance from the cover slip is key in minimizing spherical aberration. And it's really sensitive to distance from the cover slip, okay? So, and this is what I mean, just to be clear, by distance from the cover slip. I mean the distance between the lens and your sample. So, there, you know, there's all different kinds of ways you can put, put together your sample. Here's some nice ways. If you have um, a sample that you are like cells or a piece of tissue, you should be placing them on the cover slip and not the slide. Because believe it or not, that little distance that is inevitably going to be there, um, if you if you mount them like this, where the, the cell is on the slide versus the cover slip, that's gonna make a difference. It's gonna make a big difference in the in the call. Um, because you have increased the distance from the cover slip, you're going to get more spherical aberration. So just that simple little change we've made people make, and everything looks better, right? Um, 
On the right, we have uh, the top right, we have a dish that is uh, a commercially available dish made for, you can make it yourself, but commercially available that's made for um, live imaging. And so it has a cover split bottom, right? You don't want to be imaging through plastic. You want to use what the, the, what the, the lens is designed for. So this is a dish with a, a 170 micron piece of glass attached to it. On the left here, we have a setup where you have your cells on top of like, I don't know, some kind of gel, nature gel, a bunch of stuff you can come up with. Um, this is bad, right? You're going to have more spherical aberration. So if you can flip it around and get the cell to cover split, that's going to be much better. Or if you can make that layer as thin as possible, you'll get an improvement. Um, so be thinking about all this stuff when you set up your specimen, because it makes it can make a huge difference. It can be the difference between seeing your signal and not seeing it. Um, so if you use the wrong thickness of cover slip, you will see, in most cases, it, it will introduce spherical aberration. So this is a graph showing you um, the full width or half max of the axial point spread function with varying cover slip thickness. So the smaller the full width half max, the better the resolution, right? And, and in this case, better resolution is because there's minimal, uh, less spherical aberration. And so that smallest point is right at 170. So to be fair, it depends on the refractive index of the, of the um, media between the cover slip and the objective lens as well. So this is a water immersion lens. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a little better with an oil immersion lens, right? Because that minimizes refraction and uh, perhaps worse with a dry lens. Okay, so it depends on the lens how bad this can be. But there is no reason to use a cover slip other than that which was intended, the lens was intended to be used with. So, how do you know you're using the right cover slip? Cover slips are marked with a grade number. So, your box of cover slips is going to have a grade number as number zero, number one, number 1.5. That is the correct thickness of cover slip to be used with optical microscopy, period. Okay. Why do they make these other ones? I don't know. Could you buy it? <laughs> Stop by little stuff. I do. Now, I don't know if they're useful for something else, but for microscopy, you want to use number 1.5. So go home and throw away all the other cover slips and tell your PI if that it's fine. <laughs> and finally, I think this is the last slide. Um, you know, knowing all this, one of the things that I look for in the material and methods, as we told you earlier, is often quite crap, um, is proper explanation of the lens that you are using. I want you to report that you are using a 60X Plan Apo 1.4 NA numerical objective. That's the only way I can judge whether you have used a lens that's going to work with your experiment, right? That's going to optimize your experiment. And so, you know, red flag goes up when I read, I use the 60X one. That's not good. <laughs> um, okay, so that was all I prepared. We're good, good shape. Um, any questions? Yeah. I have a question about how my cell is in and So, how does the reaction come to play when you know, you're using? Yeah, yeah. So the the advantage and the reason why water immersion lenses were developed is to use with live imaging. So I which kind of like board or something I could write on. But if if you imagine you have your cover slip because they're still meant to be used with the cover slip, um, and I'll I'll just stop and differentiate. There's water immersion objective, which means you use immersion oil, or, or water instead of immersion oil. And there's water dipping lenses where you dip it right into the solution. I'm not talking about dipping lenses. With water immersion lenses, you have that glass cover slip. You've got your aqueous sample. And on the other side, you've got water. And so what that does is you get refraction as you travel through the sample into the cover slip. It refracts. And then when you hit the water, it refracts back, equal and opposite. Okay. So it sort of corrects for that refraction. The issue is that you still have this problem of, you know, it's not perfect and still have this problem of increasing spherical aberration from the cover slip. So generally those lenses come with a correction column that you have to use to correct optimally for spherical aberration. And you can only correct it at one focal point, optimally. So it will still, you'll still have more spherical aberration above and below that plane. 
However, that can be really useful. Like if you have to image, you know, deeper into the sample, that can be really useful. Those lenses are going to have a lower numerical aperture. And so, you know, it's all dependent and, and compromises and sacrifices of these and that. So, yeah.